Journal number three continued. Denderon. I didn't want to leave you guys. When I took the flume back to that subway station, my thoughts were all about Uncle Press and the mission ahead. But once I got there and saw you both, I remembered how much I missed my real life. The small time I had spent on Denderon put my head in an entirely different place. But when I saw you two, I suddenly felt like I had never left home. There was a moment where the idea of stepping into that flume and jumping back to Denderon was impossible. You were right, Courtney. It would have been easy. All I had to do was walk away. But then I remembered Uncle Press and I knew what I had to do. I had to come back. Maybe it would have been better if I had stayed with you because I've made things worse than they were. Good intentions aren't always enough. You have to be smart and sometimes I think I'm not that smart. I'll tell you what happened and you be the judge. When I took the flume back to Denderon, I was greeted by Lore. The first thing she said was, I was not sure if you would return. I got all indignant and said, hey, give me a little credit, would you? Of course, she was absolutely right. I almost stayed on second earth, but I didn't want her to know that. I wanted her to think that I was confident in our mission. She said, we are both tired. We must get sleep before we begin. Do we have enough time? I asked. I knew that Uncle Press was to be executed at the Equinox, whatever that was. It could have been in 10 minutes for all I knew. The Equinox is at midday tomorrow, she explained. When the three suns are one in the sky, we have enough time for a short rest. Now I understood. The Equinox was noon. Laura and I walked back to the small room in the mine. She didn't ask me about what was in the backpack, and I wasn't about to start explaining. That would come later. But there was one item I wanted, so I took it out. It was my digital watch. I had no idea what time it was, but if we were going to sleep, I didn't want to end up sacking out for 10 hours and waking up too late. I set the alarm to go off in two hours. That's just a long nap, and my tank was empty. Still, a few hours of sleep was better than nothing. Lore watched me curiously as I set the watch alarm. She even jumped back with surprise when it beeped. I assumed they didn't have watches where she came from. It made me feel like I had one up on her for a change. But more important, her surprise at the beep meant my guess was right. To the people of Denderon, the simple things I could pull out of this pack would seem like huge magic. Throwing someone off balance, even for a short time, might mean the difference between success and failure, or between life and death. When I dug the watch out of my pocket, I also found the extra surprise you put in there, Mark. You are the best. You know how much I love Milky Ways, and the one you stuck in that pack was the most delicious treat in the history of treats. Thanks. I even offered a piece to Lore. I thought that was pretty nice of me, since I didn't have much hope of finding another Milky Way around these parts. She took the bite-sized piece, popped it cautiously into her mouth, and instantly spit it out. What a waste. I guess they don't have candy bars on her territory either. Next time you wish to feed me poison, warn me first, she demanded. What are you talking about? Where I come from, this is a major treat, I said, still laughing. Then you come from a strange place, Pendragon, she said while taking a swig of water to wash the taste out of her mouth. It was like I had given her a Brussels sprout or something. This was the first time Laura and I weren't totally tense around each other. We were like two normal people doing normal things. Believe me, it wasn't like we were suddenly buds or anything, but it gave me the courage to ask her a question. What else did your mother tell you about being a traveler? I asked. I figured the more information I had, the better chance I had of getting out of here alive. Laura didn't answer and busied herself arranging the animal pelts on her side of the cell floor. I knew she heard me, so I didn't ask again. I had just about given up on her when she said, You may not like what I have to say. Oh, great. More good news. If it's important, I said, I should hear it whether I like it or not. Laura sat down in the pelts and leaned her back against the wall. In spite of what I had just said, I wasn't so sure I wanted to hear this, but I had to. I have only known for a short time that I am a traveler she began. I do not know much more than you do, but there is something my mother told me that is important, maybe more important than saving press and helping the Malago. This sounded big. She had my full attention. I know you want to know why we are travelers, but I do not know. That is the truth. My mother said that I would understand someday, but for now it was not important. What she did tell me, though, is that we must understand our mission. Mission? You mean there's more to this than helping the Malago? I asked. Yes, she said. My mother explained that there are many territories and they are all about to reach an important time. A turning point, she called it. It is time when the outcome will either send the territory toward peace and prosperity or plunge its people into chaos and destruction. So the battle between the Malago and the Bedouin is some kind of turning point for all of Denderon, I asked. That is what my mother said, she continued. If the Malago break free of the Bedouin, then Denderon will to continue to exist in peace. But if the Bedouin triumph, it could be a disaster that will destroy the entire territory. 
That was huge. The struggle wasn't just about helping these poor miners. It was about saving the whole territory. How did she know all this? I asked. That's like predicting the future. Lore shrugged and said, it is part of being a traveler. Someday we will understand this, but for now we must know that the traveler's mission is to go to the territories that are about to reach their turning point and do all we can to help guide events in the right direction. This is why my mother was here. That is why Press is here. That is why you and I are here. This was all a little cosmic for me. I thought I was finally getting my mind around how things worked, but I was only scratching the surface. Then who is St. Dane? I asked. St. Dane is a traveler like us, she said, but he has been working against us. He wants the territories to turn the wrong way and create pandemonium. But why? When we find that answer, we will know all there is to know, she said. Right now, I do not have those answers. Now go to sleep. Yeah, right, sleep. She just revealed that we have the future of Denderon in our hands, not to mention other territories that might be headed for trouble. And I was supposed to nod off in dreamland. And to make things just a little bit more interesting, there was a killer out there trying to stop us. I saw what this St. Dane was, dude was capable of. Sweet dreams, Bobby boy. I was on the verge of a major brain hemorrhage and had to try and calm down. I told myself that none of this had anything to do with me. I had one goal and one goal only, to rescue Uncle Press. After that, I was out of here. If Uncle Press wanted to stay and try to change the course of history, that was his choice. But for me, I was catching the next flume home. This gave me a little comfort and I tried to get some sleep. But before I put my head down, I asked, is this it? Is there anything else you're not telling me? Lord didn't even open her eyes. She was nearly asleep, but she managed to say, that is all I know, Pendragon. Is that not enough? Oh yeah, that was plenty. It was time for lights out. I thought I would have trouble knocking off, but the truth was I was so exhausted. I didn't even remember my head hitting the fur. That was great, except that it felt like I had just closed my eyes when my watch alarm went off. Two hours felt like two seconds. Man, did I go out hard. I had one of those weird waking up moments and didn't know where I was. It seemed like I was in my bed at home, and my first thought was, I gotta walk Marley. But in no time, the reality of my situation came hurling back. I sat up and tried to clear my head. Lore wasn't there. After a stretch and a yawn, I went to my pack to do inventory and saw that the clips were undone. Somebody had been going through my pack. I quickly threw it open and did a quick scan. It looked like everything was still there though it was definitely rummaged through. I was pissed. I clipped the pack shut and went looking for lore. I walked back into the now familiar main cavern of the mine. It was business as usual out there. Those poor guys never stopped. I briefly wondered what had happened with the latest transfer ceremony and if they had mined enough glaze to balance with the woman Malice had chosen. I hoped so, but there was nothing I could do about that. I needed to find lore and get to the rescue, get the rescue show on the road. I scanned the cavern and something caught my eye, Walking out of a tunnel to my left was Relin. He walked along quickly while speaking with another one of the miners. The weird thing was, these guys actually looked happy. Relin slapped the guy on the back just like they had shared some joke, and the guy took off running someplace. Now these guys had nothing to be happy about. The last time I spoke with Relin, he had pretty much condemned his entire tribe to a slow death by refusing to stand up against Kagan. Why was he happy all of a sudden? When he got farther away, I went to take a look down the tunnel they had just come from. I entered to find that it was another abandoned avenue. The ore car railroad tracks were old and rotten. This must have been one of the first tunnels they dug off the main cavern. I wondered how long ago it was. Years? Decades? Centuries? I also wondered why Relin and the other miner were down there. I found my answer a few yards in. As with many of the other tunnels, there was a chamber dug out of the rock off to the side. But unlike the cell where I had just slept, this one had a wooden door to it. I took a quick look around to see if I was being watched, then opened the door and went inside. It was a room about twice the size of the one I had just slept in, and this one was packed full of equipment. At first, I thought this was why, where they were keeping their mining tools, but on closer inspection, I saw the truth. This wasn't digging equipment. This was an armory loaded with weapons. There were hundreds of spears like the ones Uncle Press had lashed to the side of the sled we rode from the top of the mountain. I was surprised to see their sharp metal tips gleaming in the light. The Malago weren't allowed to use metal tools except in the mines, but I was sure they weren't allowed to make weapons either. One side of the room was full of these spears. Below them were stacks and stacks of arrows. There must have been thousands. Across from them were the bows for, pretty, for the arrows, probably a hundred in all. This looked to be a pretty formidable arsenal. Then I saw something that didn't quite make sense. There were large baskets placed along the back wall. I recognized them as the baskets they used to bring the glaze to the surface. 
These baskets were full, but not with glaze. I walked over to them and picked up one of the items inside. It was a small, sturdy stick about six inches long. Attached to one end were two thin leather straps about 18 inches long. At the other end of the strap, a leather pouch the size of a baseball card was attached. I looked at the strange contraption trying to figure out what it could be, and then I got it. It was a slingshot, an old-fashioned slingshot. These guys didn't have rubber, so it wasn't the kind that you could stretch back and snap to propel stones. With this thing, you had to hold the wooden stick and kind of fling the stone. There must have been a couple hundred of these babies in the baskets. As I stood there holding the slingshot, I was struck with a sad thought. Relin was right. The Malaga were not prepared to do battle with Kagan's knights. These slingshots were pitiful. Sure, we all knew the story about David slaying Goliath, but that was just a story. How did these guys think they could stand a chance against trained killer knights in an armor using these toys? The spears looked a little more dangerous. The arrows did too. But the Malago, did the Malago even know how to use them? Suddenly, Relin's concern seemed very real to me. If they tried to fight the Bedouin, they'd be slaughtered. I was just about to drop the slingshot back into the basket when somebody reached out and grabbed it from my hand. I turned in surprise to see Figgis. He danced away from me, swinging the slingshot over his head. Changed your mind, have you? He chirped. Ready to make a trade? I don't want anything from you, I said as strongly as I could. No, I have many things you may need, he said with a toothless smile. How about this? He took something from his waist pouch and held it up to me. It was a red Swiss army knife. That's mine, I shouted and grabbed it away from him. You went through my pack. What else did you take? The mystery of why my pack was worked over had been solved. Figgis didn't put, it up, didn't put up a fight for it. He just cackled out a wheezy laugh. I know what you really need, he said slyly. I know, I know. What do I need? I asked, losing patience. You need tack, he announced. I am the one, the only one who can get it for you. Tack, there was that word again. What is tack, I asked. Figgis laughed again and reached into his waist pouch. Tack is the answer, he said reverently. Tack is the hope. Whatever tack was, it couldn't be very big because it fit in his pouch. He was just about to pull it out when Relin walked in. Figgis, he shouted. Figgis instantly pulled his hand back out of the pouch, empty. He looked incredibly guilty. You should not have brought him here, old man, Relin chastised. Figgis cowered and ran out of the room like a guilty puppy. Whatever Tack was, it was clear he did not want Relin to know that he was trying to sell me some. I am sorry you saw this room, he said, sounding tired. I do not want you to think we still have hope of fighting the better one. These weapons will soon be destroyed. Something wasn't right. Relin wasn't telling me the whole truth. I figured, since he wasn't being totally up front with me, then I should be careful about what I said to him, so I didn't mention the tack thing that Figgis was trying to tell me. I guess you gotta do what you gotta do, was all I could think of saying. I didn't like being there, especially since there was something going on that I wasn't clear on. The best thing for me to do, then, was leave. So I walked past Relin and out the door. He didn't say another word to me. Once away from there, my thoughts went back to the problem at hand, which was Uncle Press. So I ran back to the cell where my gear was. When I stepped inside that room, I saw that Laura and Alder were there and that they were going through my stuff. They had it spread out all over the floor. Wasn't there anything such as privacy around here? Hey, I shouted. Alder jumped back, embarrassed, but Laura kept right on rummaging. I am looking for the weapons you brought back, she said without a hint of apology. I see no weapons here, she said this while shaking one of the yellow walkie-talkies you sent. I grabbed it from her and said, I didn't get any weapons. I wouldn't even know how to use a weapon. Then this is all useless, she spat out. That's what you think, I said, and handed her back the walkie-talkie. Then I found the other walkie-talkie and stepped to the far side of the room. I put it up to my mouth, hit the send button, and said, boo. Both Laura and Alder jumped in surprise. Laura threw the walkie-talkie away like it was hot. Alder caught it, and then he threw it too. Man, how excellent was that? It was the exact reaction I was hoping for. What is this magic, said Alder with wide eyes. It isn't magic, I said. You gotta understand, my territory is way more advanced than here. Things like this are pretty common where I come from. It's not magic, it's science. I picked up the small CD boombox you sent and hit play. Instantly, the first track started to play. It was a headbanger rock song with thrashing guitars that sent Laura and Alder into a panic. They covered their ears and ran to the far side of the room like frightened rabbits. It was awesome. I didn't want to prolong their agony, so I turned the music off quickly. The two sat there staring at me with wide, frightened eyes. Still think we need weapons? I asked with a sly smile. Then I saw something that totally blew me away. Laura looked to me and, believe it or not, she smiled. I like this science, she said. Me too, added Alder. So far, so good. 
Their reactions gave me hope that my ideas might work. The trick was to use this stuff the right way, and the time to do that was coming fast. I took qu a quick inventory and saw that you were able to get everything except for the flashlight. You guys are amazing. I was a little surprised to see that none of the stuff was mine, though. I didn't mean for you to go out and get new stuff or to send your own, Mark. But after I thought about it, I realized that it would have been hard for you to go to my house and get my stuff. My parents would have asked questions and that would have been tricky. So as soon as I can, I'll repay you for everything. I gave one of the walkie-talkies to Lore and showed her how to use it. If we got split up, these would be crucial. The rest of the equipment I put back in the pack. Alder then added something that was a little surprising. He gave us each clothes that the better one wear inside the palace. They were simple pants and jackets with long sleeves. The pants had pockets and were tied with a drawstring. The jackets closed with button-like pieces of wood. They were light, almost pastel colors of green and blue. But the thing that really jumped out at me was that they were soft. The material was some kind of cotton, and they were really comfortable. Even the leather shoes were comfortable. If I didn't know better, I'd guess that the Bedouin did their shopping at the Gap. It really struck me how the Malago lived their lives wearing rough, smelly caveman skins, while the Bedouin wore these coolio, comfortable clothes that were like pajamas. Lord didn't want to wear them. She wanted Alder to get us armor from the knights, but Alder explained that the knights were not allowed to wear their armor in the palace. If we were seen inside wearing armor, the Bedouin would instantly take notice and we'd be lost. Wearing the clothes he gave us was our best chance of blending in. Lore didn't like it, but she couldn't argue with the logic, so we were quickly dressed in the Bedouin outfits. Alder also had something else of value, a map of the palace. It was crude and drawn roughly on some parchment paper, but it was good enough. It didn't show everything, but it had the key areas we needed to worry about, the cell area where Uncle Press was being held and the guard quarters where the knights stayed. Everything seemed in place for one, except for one small detail, maybe the most important detail of all. This is all good, I said, but how are we going to get in? There is a way, Alder said. The Bedouin do not know of it, and very few of the Malago are aware. My brother showed it to me the day before he died. Now there was some new information. Alder had a brother who died. I wanted to know what that was all about, but now was not the time for chit-chat. Then let's go, I said. I put on the pack and followed the others out of the cell. Rather than turn for the main mine shaft to start climbing the, to the surface, Alder led us to one of the ore cars. No sense in all of us walking, said Alder. Jump in. Wherever we were going, it was underground. Laura and I climbed into the ore car, and Alder started to push. We headed down the track of yet another tunnel off the main cavern. As we passed some miners, they barely took notice of us. These poor guys were like the living dead. Alder was a pretty strong guy, and he pushed us along with ease. Luckily, the tunnel was flat, so maybe it wasn't all that hard anyway. We traveled for a long time and went pretty deep into the mine. After a while, it got totally dark, but it wasn't like we had to make a turn or anything, so Alder kept on pushing. As the tunnel started to grow brighter, I looked ahead and saw a small spot of light way in the distance. Before I could ask what it was, Alder said, The tunnel leads to the sea. The end is not far from here. You cannot enter from the outside because the opening is high in the bluffs. It is to bring fresh air into the mines. Fresh air, yeah, right. Not fresh enough to get rid of the poisonous gas that was killing all the miners. I then noticed something else weird. Throughout all the tunnels, the walls looked the same. They were made of solid, craggy rock that had been chiseled out by hand. But here it was different. Along one side of the tunnel were round stone columns. They were wide, too, maybe three feet in diameter, and looked to me like big ancient columns from Greek ruins. The miners uncovered these by accident many years ago, Alder said. They are the foundation of the Bedouin palace. Whoa, that meant we were directly under the fortress. The Bedouin do not know that the Malago have tunneled under their palace, Alder said. If they did, they would have closed this tunnel off and killed some miners in punishment. There must have been about 20 of these pillars, and they were roughly 10 yards apart. I saw off to the side, between two of the stone pillars, another tunnel. Actually, it was more like a small recess because it was just in, because just inside it was a ladder. Obviously, this ladder led up into the palace. Gulp. No one knows why this secret entrance was created, said Alder as we climbed out of the car. It is older than any of the miners who are alive today. I stood at the bottom of the ladder and looked up. I then looked back at the others. It was showtime. Let's make sure we're all on the same page, I said. Our plan is to get to the cell where they're keeping Uncle Press as quietly as possible. If this becomes a fight, we'll lose. I said this while looking straight at Lore. She looked away from me. I knew she agreed, but it was killing her. Alder, I said. Can you get us to the cell area? Yes, I think so, was his answer. 
You think or you know? I didn't want anything left to chance. I know, came his more confident reply. Good, I said. But it is not going to be easy to get back unnoticed. And that is when we fight, said Lore. Yeah, whatever, I said, and turned for the ladder. Jeez, she had a one-track mind. It wasn't until I got halfway up the ladder that I realized I didn't want to be the first one up. What was I thinking? I had no idea what might be waiting for me on the top, but it was too late now. We weren't about to change places while dangling in the air, so I continued to climb and ended up on a dark shelf of stone. The ceiling was also stone, and it was so low that I couldn't stand up straight. The others quickly joined me. Now what? I asked. Alder knew exactly where to go. He walked a few feet along the stone ledge and then raised his hands. I looked to see that above him was a wooden door, a trap door. Alder pushed it up easily and then hoisted himself through it. Laura was next. She easily pulled herself up. It wasn't as easy for me. Not only was I shorter, but I had the pack on. I stood below the open trap door looking up and said, uh, excuse me, little help, please. Laura and Alder both reached down, grabbed my outstretched hands and hoisted me up as easily as if I were a child. We were now in another dark room. This leads to a storage room off the kitchen, Alder whispered. I figured that since he was whispering, we were getting close to where we might come across some Bedouin. Alder led us across the small room and then felt along one of the walls. I wasn't sure what he was looking for until he found it. There was a small notch carved into the stone. Alder stuck his fingers in and pulled. Suddenly, the wall opened up as if it were a door. We quickly went through and Alder closed the secret door behind us. When I looked back, I saw that once it was closed, you could barely see the seam where the door was. The wall was smooth, as if it were made out of plaster. That seemed weird. Everything I had seen so far on Denderon was crude and rough. This wall seemed almost modern. I looked around to see that we were in a storage room. There were baskets of food and rough burlap bags full of stuff. There were also stacks and stacks of earthen pots. I was hit with a bunch of new smells. For the last several hours, I had been smelling that nasty sweet smell in the mines, but now I got the definite aroma of cooking food. I had no idea what it was, but it was making my mouth water. All I could think of was how my house smelled at Thanksgiving. My stomach rumbled. So did Lors, I'm glad to say. On the far wall was a wooden door. Alder crept, crept quietly to it and gently eased it open. Instantly, the sounds of banging pots and sizzling food filled the room, like a busy restaurant kitchen. Again, my stomach rumbled. I wanted to get out of here as soon as possible because this was torture. Alder waved for us to come and look. Laura and I joined him at the door and peered out. What I saw gave me a total shock. This was a busy kitchen. Several cooks scurried around carrying large succulent roast turkeys cooked to a golden brown. Other cooks were peeling vegetables and cutting potatoes on large wooden tables. Others were stirring pots of fragrant soups that bubbled on fiery stoves. But that wasn't the shocking thing. What surprised me was how modern this kitchen was. Believe me, by our standards, it was still pretty ancient looking, but not compared to what I'd seen so far on Denderon. The pots were crudely shaped and hammered out of black metal. The ovens were made of stone with fires burning inside. The chefs slid the turkeys and other roasts in and out of these ovens with long paddles. Their other utensils didn't exactly look as if they came from the mall. They were crudely made and very simple, but still, this setup was light years ahead of anything the Malago had. I saw a device that looked like a dumbwaiter. The chefs placed platters of sumptuous steaming food into a hole in the wall, then pulled on a rope that raised the small elevator and its cargo up into the palace. They even had running water. I saw iron sinks with hand pumps that produced clean, fresh water. Unbelievable. The Bedouin had running water while the Malago had disgusting sewer holes in their crude huts. It was then that I noticed the kitchen workers. As they went busily about their chores, they had a different look than anyone else I had seen on Denderon. Their features were all very small and delicate, like perfect dolls. Everything about them was small. Their hands, their feet, and even their height. Their eyes were different, too. They slanted down, which gave them kind of an Asian feel. They all wore outfits like we had on, but theirs were white. But the thing that jumped out the most about them was their skin. It, too, was pure white. I don't mean pale skin like the Malago. I mean white. Believe it or not, it wasn't creepy. In some strange way, they were beautiful people. They just happened to look like porcelain dolls. Alder must have been reading my mind because he whispered, The workers in the palace are not Bedouin. They are brought from a place across the ocean called Nova. Why don't they use the Malago to do their work, I asked. They make them do everything else. Because they don't want the Malago to see how well they live, answered Alder with a trace of venom. They are afraid it would cause unrest. That was an understatement. If I were a Malago and saw this, I'd be downright pissed. Heck, I was getting pissed anyway, and hungry. Those turkeys smelled good. Look, said Laura as she pointed across the kitchen. 
Standing in the doorway was a guy who was definitely not from Nova. He was so big that he filled the opening. He wore the same kind of clothes we had on and stood with his hands on his hips, surveying the kitchen. Around his waist was a leather belt from which dangled a nasty-looking club. I could feel Alder tense up. It is a better one night, he whispered. I do not like this. The knights never come to the kitchens. He must be looking for something. You think they know we're here? I asked nervously. I do not know, answered Alder. But if he catches us, we are finished before we even begin. The knight stepped into the kitchen and slowly walked around to survey things. The Novens paid no attention to him, and he didn't acknowledge them either. His eyes slowly scanned the room, taking everything in. We were trapped. In a few moments, he would certainly enter this closet and find us. Alder said nervously, We should go back to the mines. We can wait until he's gone and then return. There isn't time, snapped Lor. When he enters the door, we will overpower him and throw him into the mine. That wasn't a good idea either. We weren't about to kill the guy. At least I wasn't about to. And he'd, sure, he'd be sure to wake up and sound some kind of alarm. And who know what the Novens would do if a knight entered their pantry and never came out. No, beating up on the guy wasn't the answer. I quickly pulled off my pack and dug into one of the side pouches looking for a better solution. What are you doing? demanded Lore. I've got an idea, I answered. If it doesn't work, we'll do it your way. I found what I was looking for and quickly moved back to the door. The night was only a few yards away. There wasn't much time. He looked into a large pot of soup and reached in to take a taste. The slob. That's when I took my shot. The thing I pulled out was the laser pointer you sent. I clicked it on and aimed the red beam at the pot of soup. From somewhere we were, it was easy to see the red laser dot against the black pot. I could only hope that the knight saw it too. He pulled his hand out of the pot and started to suck on his finger to taste the soup. But still, he didn't see the laser. Alder and Lore watched the scene over my shoulder. Of course, they had no idea what this laser thing was, but now wasn't the time to ask. I jiggled the beam a little so that the red dot danced on the pot. The knight stood there, stood there sucking on his tasty finger. He was just about to reach back into the pot for a double dip when he saw it. He looked at the jumping dot curiously without even taking his finger out of his mouth. The idiot. Then I slowly moved the dot off the pot and let it travel across the stove. The knight, with his finger still in his mouth, followed it. This was like the game I play with Marley in a flashlight. I'd shine the beam on the floor and Marley would jump at it. The poor dog never got the idea that the spot of light wasn't something she could get her paws on, but that didn't stop her from trying. That's exactly what happened with the knight. I slowly moved the red laser dot over the loaves of bread, past bubbling pots, across wooden tables, down along the floor, and back up onto the wall. The curious knight never took his eyes off of it. He followed the magical red light like... Well, like a dog following a flashlight beam. What he didn't realize is that I was moving him farther and farther away from us. Once his back was to us, I silently motioned to the others to get moving. They slowly but silently opened the pantry door and crept out into the kitchen. I was right on their tails. While still concentrating on holding the beam steady to keep the dumbfounded knight entertained, we quickly, quickly moved across the kitchen to the exit. The Novins didn't even give us a second look. I was the last one out. My body was already out of the door, but I leaned back in, directing the beam. Then I turned off the laser and couldn't resist waiting one last second to see the befuddled knight's reaction. It was perfect. He stood still for a moment, then started looking around frantically. Sheesh, even Marley wasn't stupid enough to do that. I wanted to laugh out loud, but I couldn't stay to enjoy the show. We had to get moving, so I followed the other two into the palace. We had made it. We were in. The next step was to make our way to the cell where Uncle Press was being kept. Alder was already checking the map. All Laura and I could do was follow him and try to blend in. As it turned out, it wasn't all that difficult. The palace was busy with Bedouin people, who all, more or less, looked and dressed like us. Yes, Laura's skin was a bit darker than most, but not so much that she stood out. If no one recognized us for who we really were, we might just make it. As we made our way through the corridors, what I saw was not only surprising, it made an anger grow inside of me that I never thought possible. The fortress was nothing like I expected. From the outside, it looked like an ancient stone castle like they had in medieval times. I had seen pictures of those castles that still stood in England, and the interiors were just as cr crudely simple as the exteriors. Here, I expected to see corridors of stone and tiny cell-like rooms. I expected the floors to be of dirt and the light to come from windows or torches. You know, your basic Robin Hood-style castle. But this is not at all what we found inside the Bedouin Fortress. The kitchen had been my first hint that all was not going to be what I thought. I'm telling you, Mark and Courtney, this place was beautiful. The walls were smooth and painted with light colors. Near the ceilings were elaborate decorative paintings done right on the walls. 
Some corridors had paintings of vines and flowers that stretched the whole length of the wall. Other corridors had paintings of people who were probably famous Bedouins from the past. The ceilings were decorated with colorful chips of glass that were sculpted into beautiful patterns. The floors were all tiled with intricate marble work, and the place was totally clean. Every so often, we'd pass one of the Novan servants on his hands and knees, scrubbing the floors or dusting the statues that stood on tables like this was some kind of museum. Laura and I exchanged glances. We were both thinking the same thing. How could these people live in such elegance at the expense of the Malago people? I saw that Laura's jaw was clenching. She was angry, too. We heard music coming from a room we were about to pass. As we went by, I glanced in to see a small concert going on. Three musicians sat on chairs playing oddball instruments like I had never seen before. They were string instruments, but they were shaped like human forms. It was really bizarro. The music they played was sweet and soothing. Several Bedouins lounged around listening on big, cushy pillows. Pillows! These people had pillows! And to top it all off, they had Novan servants scrambling around and serving them fruit from large platters. The more of the Bedouin people I saw, the more I realized that they were a pretty soft bunch, except for the knights, of course. All the others had this kind of baby fat thing going on. The men, the women, even the kids all looked as if they needed to hit the gym. I guess that's what happens when you have nothing to do except lie around, eat stuff, and listen to lame music. And here's the wildest thing. In every corridor along the walls, there was thin glass tubes about the diameter of a nickel. These tubes stretched the whole length of every corridor, and they gave off light. Light! They didn't have electricity here, but they figured out some way to make artificial light. The bottom line is that these guys were incredibly advanced. By our standards, they were still back in the Dark Ages, but compared to the Malago, they were the Jetsons. I was amazed at first, but my amazement was replaced by anger. The Malago were dying and living in squalor so that these people could get fat and live in lu such luxury. It was just flat wrong. The more I saw of how these people lived, the more determined I grew to get Uncle Press out of there so he could help the Malago even things out a little. All the while, I was taking in this rich surroundings. Alder had been leading us through the maze of corridors. The kitchen was on the lowest level of the palace. We had climbed one set of wide circular stairs to the next level. According to the map, this was the level where the prisoners were kept. Finally, we came to an area that was a little less fancy than the rest of the fortress. The walls didn't have paintings on them and the floors and ceilings were bare. I guess that this is where they kept their prisoners, though it was a lot, still a lot nicer than where the Malago lived. At a turn in the corridor, Alder motioned for us to stop. He took a cautious peek around the corner, then turned back to us. There is good news and bad news, he said. The cell where Press is being held is being guarded. That means he's still there. Okay, I said. What's the bad news? The bad news is that there are six knights keeping guard. Uh-oh. I took a peek around the corner to see for myself. Alder was right. There were six guards there, and these weren't fat and sassy better ones either. These were soldier-looking soldier knights, solid-looking knights. Each was dressed the same as we were and had the same club weapons hanging from their belts as the knight in the kitchen. This was bad. There was no way we were getting past those guys. I snuck back to the other two, looked right at Laura, and said, Don't even think about taking those guys on. We must do something, countered Laura, or this was all for nothing. Alder added, And the equinox is fast approaching. We gotta get the knights away from the door, I said. You know how this place works, Alder. What can we do that would make them leave their post? Alder thought and then said, it would take some sort of emergency, something they had to respond to quickly. Keep going, I said, think. Alder looked around, he had no clue, but then his eye caught on something near the ceiling. He stared at it for a moment and smiled. Laura and I both looked up to where his gaze were fixed. What we saw was something that looked like a pipe. It was about six inches in diameter and ran along the wall right by the ceiling. What's that? I asked. You have something in your bag, said Alder. It has a handle with a jagged metal blade. I knew exactly what he meant. I dug into my pack and pulled out the camp saw. This one was even better than the one I asked you for, Mark. All I wanted was a small saw from my dad's workshop, but you gave me this Coolio thing that folded in half to fit in the pack. Alder opened it up, locked the saw blade, and felt the sharpness of its teeth. This is for cutting, he asked. Yeah, I answered. What are you thinking? Alder looked back up at the pipe in the ceiling and said, That carries water throughout the fortress, he answered. He then looked at us with a devilish smile. It took me a second, but I figured out what his plan was and smiled back. You can cut through that thing, I asked. Like soft fruit, was his confident answer. Lore still didn't get it. Why would you do that? She asked angrily. She was ticked that we were a few steps ahead of her. Alder answered, I will go a few corridors over and cut out a section of the water carrier. 
It'll make a mess, I said, enjoying the thought. Yes, it will, he said, enjoying the idea as much as I was. And of course, the missing piece will not be found anywhere. That's perfect, dude. Go, I said. Alder took off running in the opposite direction, away from the prison corridor. Laura and I hid ourselves in a small room around the corner, waiting for the excitement to begin. I did not think we would get this far, she said. Neither did I, rep I replied. We waited a few minutes, but nothing happened. I was getting nervous. Laura seemed calm. She had her game face on. Maybe she was used to this pre-battle moment, but my stomach was a knot of tension. I couldn't take it anymore and jumped up. I gotta see how he's doing, I said. Pendragon, no, she hissed and tried to grab me, but there was no way I could wait there any longer. I moved quickly in the direction that Alder had gone, peeking down the corridors at each junction, expecting to see him. Finally, I rounded a corner and there he was. Alder was standing on a table, sawing away at the pipe. He had already sawed all the way through once and water was leaking down on him. There was a pool of water growing on the floor, but the best was yet to come. With a few final pulls on the saw, he sliced through a second and pulled a chunk down that was two feet long. The second he pulled it down, water started gushing out like a berserk fire hydrant. Alder got doused and was nearly knocked over by the force. I sure hoped this was fresh water and not sewage. That would have been nasty. Effective, but nasty. Alder got his bearings, caught sight of me, and held up the hunk of pipe triumphantly. Then suddenly, ah! A bed of one woman had rounded the corner on the far end and saw the waterworks. The alarm had officially been sounded. Alder tucked the pipe away like a football and ran in the opposite direction from me. I was now in the wrong spot and started back to Lore. I had to force myself to walk. I didn't want anyone thinking that I was running away from the scene of the crime, which is exactly what I was doing. It was a good thing, too, because no sooner did I slow down than I saw the team of knights that had been guarding Uncle Press come running toward me, or should I say, toward the screaming woman. They ran past me as if I wasn't even there. I really wanted to stay and watch the madness as they tried to stop the water, but that's not why I was here. It was time to spring Uncle Press. When I got back to Lore, she was up and peering around the corner toward the cell. She sensed I was near and turned to face me. There is only one guard left, she said. It is my turn. She reached behind her back and from underneath her jacket, she pulled a smaller version of her wooden stick weapon. I had no idea she had it. Sneaky. She was all set to charge, but I stopped her. No, I said as strongly as possible. They don't know we're here yet. The longer we can be secret, the better chance we have of getting out. There is no other way, Pendragon, she said seething. She wanted to fight. I took a quick glance around the corridor to see the guard standing there. Further down, the corridor ended at a balcony. My guess was that this balcony overlooked the ocean. I had an idea. Can you get to that balcony without him knowing? I asked. Lore took a quick look, turned to see that there was a parallel corridor behind us and said, yes, then go. I'll send him to you. Lore wanted to ask how, but I pushed her to go before she had the chance. I figured if the laser pointer trick worked once, it would work again. So I waited a few minutes to make sure Lore was in position, then took the pointer out of my pocket. When I clicked it on, the beam didn't work. I clicked it a few more times. I banged it. I took out the battery to clean it. Nothing worked. It was dead, and so was I. I didn't know how much longer the other knights would be occupied with the water geyser, and Lore was waiting for me to do something. I dug in my backpack looking for an answer, and I found it. It was the radio-controlled stunt cycle. If the batteries failed on this baby, then we were out of luck. It wasn't as good... I wasn't as good with the stunt cycle as with my four-wheeled Humvee, but I understand why you guys couldn't go to my house to get it. It was going to be the stunt cycle or nothing. I still remember the day you got this for your birthday, Mark. We both picked up on the radio controls pretty quick and had that cycle taking air, taking air off ramps in no time. The plastic helmet on the driver still had the scars from all the times that he landed on his head, but I wasn't planning any tricks with him today. All I wanted him to do was drive straight and smooth. If I could pull that off, then we might have a chance. So I took the little motorcycle out of my pack, reached around the corner of the corridor, and put him on the floor. My plan was to send it slowly past the guard, but I didn't want him to see me standing there with the radio controls. I had to do this blind. I took a breath, then pushed the forward stick. The motorcycle hummed to life with that familiar whine. I wasn't sure how fast it was going, but I couldn't take the chance of looking too soon. I, if I sent it off course, I was dead. If I sent it too slowly, the guard might just bend over and pick it up. So I forced myself to count to ten, then peeked an eye around the corner. I saw exactly what I wanted to see. The guard was standing at the door, dumbfounded, staring at the little man on the motorcycle. I can't imagine what was going through his mind. I couldn't tell if he was curious or scared, probably a little of both. I had the motorcycle moving on a perfectly straight line, headed for the far end of the corridor. So far, so good. But just as the cycle was about to roll past him, the guard took a step forward and reached down to pick it up. 
I quickly hit the throttle and the cycle shot ahead, just barely out of his grasp. Maybe I was better at this than I thought. This seemed to get the guard's curiosity up even further, and he walked after the cycle. Perfect. This was like playing a fish on a line. I teased him by slowing up. When he would bend down to pick it up, I shot it forward. The whole time, he kept moving closer and closer to the balcony on the far end of the corridor where Lore was lying in wait. With one final push on the throttle, I accelerated the motorcycle forward, and it shot out onto the balcony. The guard walked out behind it. He looked down, then hesitated because he expected it to move again, but it didn't. He stared at it for a second, then suddenly bent over and snatched it up with one quick move. But his victory was short-lived because he never stood up again. Lore jumped out and whacked him with her mini stick. With two quick moves, she slammed the guy, pivoted, and sent him sailing over the rail into the ocean. Mission accomplished, and we hadn't given ourselves away. I quickly reached into my pocket and pulled out my walkie-talkie. Get Alder, I commanded into the yellow walkie. Lore definitely heard me because she took off running along the balcony and out of sight. I put my walkie-talkie away and looked to the cell door. There was nothing left between me and Uncle Press but that door, so I quickly grabbed my pack and ran for it. It was too much to expect that the door would be unlocked, and it wasn't. There was an old-fashioned keyhole, but of course I had no key, so I dug into my pack to look for something that might help me open the door. All I could come up with was a Swiss Army knife that I had nabbed back from Figgis. I opened up the awl blade and stuck it into the keyhole, figuring I might be able to turn the lock somehow, but it didn't work. I jammed the awl up and down desperately. If I couldn't open the lock, then maybe I could break it. I think that's exactly what happened, because with one final twist, the latch moved and the door opened. I was in, or should I say, Uncle Press was out. Uncle Press, I shouted as I ran in. It's me. We got to get. The small cell was empty. Uncle Press wasn't there. I didn't understand why it would be guarded if there was no one there to guard. The answer came quickly. Ah, somebody jumped me from behind. He leaped up on my back, wrapped his legs around my wrist and tried to wrestle me to the ground. Let me out of here, you filthy Bedouin pig, he shouted. The guy wasn't very heavy or very strong for that matter. All I had to do was spin once and he went flying off. He landed on the hard door floor with a loud thud that must have knocked the wind out of him. I looked down and saw that this definitely was not Uncle Press. It was a grimy little guy dressed in Malago skins. His hair and beard were incredibly long, which meant he'd been there for a long time. Where's my uncle? I shouted. The strange little man looked up at me with confusion in his eyes. You, you are not Bedouin? He asked. No, I'm here to get my uncle. Where is he? The guy took a while to answer. I guess he wasn't used to this much excitement. Join the club. Neither was I. You must be Pendragon, he said. Yes, and I'm looking for my uncle. Do you know where he is? They took him, answered the Malago prisoner, early, before the suns came up. He is to be executed today. Yeah, I knew that. This guy wasn't helping much. I didn't know where to turn. Uncle Press could be anywhere. My mind raced, but I didn't come up with a single answer. I was in total brain lock when my walkie-talkie came to life. Pendragon, came Alder's voice. I found Press. He is not in his cell. I grabbed my walkie and said to him, yeah, I know. Where is he? I am with him now, he came back. I will direct you to us. Hurry. We were back in the game. I glanced at the Malago prisoner and said, now's your chance. Get out. Then I turned and ran out of the cell. I quickly ran back toward the mayhem that Alder had caused. The water was still gushing out of the pipes and the corridor was totally flooded. Knights and Novins worked together trying to stop the flow, but they were doing a lousy job. Good. It kept them busy. Alder then came through the walkie-talkie saying, go back to the stairs and climb two more levels. Got it. I did what I was told, but when I entered the stairwell, I saw something down below that nearly made my heart stop. Coming up fast from the lower level were a dozen knights, and these guys were in full battle gear carrying spears. I think some kind of alarm must have finally sounded. They knew we were here. One of them looked up and saw me. There he is, shouted the knight. Yep, they knew we were here. The knights began to run. There was no way I could outrace these guys, so I played my final card. I pulled the CD boombox out of the pack, held it in front of me, cranked the volume, and hit play. Instantly, the thrashing rock guitar blasted out of the speakers. It was like I had thrown a bomb at these guys. They froze in their tracks with a look of total shock on each and every one of their faces. They had never heard anything like this before and probably never would again. They turned and fled back down the stairs in total panic. Under other circumstances, I would have thought this was pretty funny. Right now, it just felt like victory. I left the boombox on the stairs, figuring this would be as good as putting up a gate to keep them down there. Pendragon, hurry, came Alder's voice through the walkie. As I started to run back up the stairs, I grabbed my walkie and called to him. I'm almost on the fourth level. Turn left at the top and go to the end of the corridor, he instructed. We're hiding in the last room to the left, before the balcony. I tucked the walkie away and ran to where he told me. My mind was working ahead to the few next few moves. 
We had to find Laura and get out, but we couldn't get back out through the kitchen because I had the night's trap down there. There had to be another way out. Hopefully Alder had one because I sure didn't. I got to the top of the stairs, made the turn, and ran down the corridor. I realized briefly that this corridor was more ornate than any we had seen so far. There were huge sculptures and giant paintings on the walls. It would have been pretty cool if, it, if I weren't so scared out of my mind. But I had reached my destination. The last room on the left was where Alder and Uncle Press were waiting for me. Hopefully Laura was there too. I ran into the room and skidded to a sudden stop. It took all of a half second for me to realize that this had gone terribly wrong. I turned to run back out, but two Bedouin knights jumped out in front of me, blocking the door. I was trapped. Slowly, I turned back to see Alder standing there holding the walkie-talkie. A knight had a spear to his throat. Alder looked as if he was going to cry. I, I'm sorry, Pendragon, he cried. They were going to kill her. Two other knights were holding Lore. One had her arms and the other had a knife to her throat. You should have let them, she spat out in defiance. There were a few other people in the room, too. Seeing them is why I knew all was lost. One of them was St. Dane, or Malice, as he calls himself here. He stood with his arms folded and a smug smile on his face. But it was the final person in the room who gave me the biggest surprise of all. This person was seated on a large, ornate throne that was decorated with cut pieces of glaze. I didn't need to be told who it was. This was the heir to the throne of the better one. This was the monarch who had, ki who had their father killed so they could begin their tyrannical rule over the Milago. This was the person who ordered the deaths of Milago as easily as ordering more glaze. This was Kagan's throne room, and seated on the throne was Kagan. The thing that surprised me, though, is that Kagan was a woman. Hello, Pendragon, said St. Dane. Lovely day for an execution, don't you think? The one person missing from the room was Uncle Press.